Welcome everyone and happy Father's Day. There are two announcements this morning. One, don't forget our annual meeting at 1 p.m. today. Of course, it's a virtual meeting. And we will be having a socially distant ice cream social in the parking lot. Rita's ice cream truck will be selling ice cream treats at $5 a piece on Saturday, July 11th from 2 to 4 p.m. Please wear a mask and practice social distancing while attending. If you have any questions, contact Abigail Dressler. We look forward to seeing you there. Again, happy Father's Day. Our opening words are from Robert Fulgham's book, it was on fire when I laid down on it. And let me warn you, it's a little long, but it's well worth it. This is 1963. From deep in the canyon aisles of a supermarket comes what sounds like a small scale bus wreck followed by an air raid. If you followed the running box boy armed with mop and broom, you would come across a young father, his three year old son, an upturned shopping cart, and a good part of the pickle shelf all on a heap on the floor. The child, who sits on a plastic bag of ripe tomatoes, is experiencing what might nicely be described as significant fluid loss. Tears mixed with mucus from a running nose, mixed with blood from a small fore forehead abrasion, mixed with saliva drooling from a mouth, that is wide open and making a noise that would drive a dog under a bed. The kid has also wet his pants and will likely throw up before this tragedy reaches bottom. He has that stand back, here it comes look of a child in pre erp condition. The small lake of pickle juice surrounding the child doesn't make rescue any easier for the supermarket 9-11 squad arriving on the scene. The child is not hurt. And the father has had some experience with this uselessness of stop crying or I'll smack you syndrome and has remained amazingly quiet and still in the face of the catastrophe. The father is calm because he is thinking about running away from home now, just walking away, getting into the car, driving away somewhere down south, changing his name, getting a job as a paper boy or cook, in an all-night diner, something, anything that doesn't involve contact with three-year-olds. Oh, sure, someday he may find all this amusing, but in the most private part of his heart, he is sorry he has children, sorry he married, sorry he grew up, and above all, sorry that this particular son cannot be traded in for a model that works. He will not and cannot say these things to anybody, ever, but they are there and they are not funny. The box boy and the manager and the accumulated spectators are terribly sympathetic and consoling. Later, the father sits in his car in the parking lot, holding the sobbing child in his arms until the child sleeps. He drives home and carries the child up to his crib and tucks him in. The father looks at the sleeping child for a long time. The father does not run away from home. This is 1976. The man paces my living room, carelessly cursing and weeping by turns. <clears throat> In his hand is what's left of a letter that has been crumpled into a ball and then uncrumpled again several times. The letter is from his 16-year-old son, the same son, the pride of his father's eye, or was until today's mail. The son says he hates him and never wants to see him again. The son is going to run away from home because of his terrible father. The son thinks the father is a failure as a parent. The son thinks the father is a jerk. What the father thinks of the son right now is somewhat incoherent, but it isn't nice. Outside the house is a lovely day, the first day of spring. But inside the house, it's more like a populace now the first day of one man's next stage of fathering. The old gray ghost of Oedipus has just stomped through his life. 
someday, some long day from now. He may laugh about this even. For the moment, there's only anguish. He is really a good man and a fine father. The evidence of this is overwhelming. And the son is of quality goods as well, just like his father, they say. Why did this happen to me? The father shouts at the ceiling. Well, he had a son. That's all it takes. And it doesn't do any good to explain about that right now. First, you have to live through it. Wisdom comes later. Just have to stand there like a jackass in the hailstorm and take it. This is 1988. Same man and same son. The son is 28 now, married with his own three-year-old son, home, career, and all the rest. The father is 50. Three mornings a week, I see them out jogging together around 6 a.m. As they cross a busy street, I see the son look both ways with his hand on his father's elbow, the holding back from the danger of oncoming cars, protecting him from harm. I hear them laughing as they run up the hill in the morning. And when they sprint towards home, the son doesn't run ahead, but runs alongside his father at his pace. They love each other a lot. You can see it. They are very careful of each other, care hyphen full of each other. They have been through a lot together, but it's all right now. One of their favorite stories about once upon a time in a supermarket. This is now. And this story is always. It's been lived thousands of times over thousands of years, and literature is full of examples of tragic endings, including that of Oedipus. The sons have kick away and burn all bridges, never to be seen again. But sometimes, more often than not, I suspect they come back in their own way, in their own time, and take to their own fathers in their arms. That ending is an old one, too. The father of the prodigal son can tell you. Our opening hymn is hymn number 359, When We Are Gathered. and griefs that mark each path of life and thus we reach for those who love we reach for those who love for youth shall pass and time is wise of countless seasons turned so day by day our years increase until at last by life released our spirits shine like stars our spirits shine like stars our chalice reading is from Jim Valvano yes the basketball coach of NC State fame and the V Foundation when he died of cancer. But here's the quote, it's only a sentence. My father gave me the greatest gift anyone could give another person. He believed in me. Oh, 
the stirrings of compassion blowing the wind rising the sea moving the hand giving life the shape of justice roots hold me Now is the time we share joys and sorrows. I'd like to drop the first stone for our country. What we're going through now is amazing, and we could all use some mercy and some help. I'd like to drop another stone for all the people that are deployed in service. and drop another stone for all of us in the congregation, still hunkered down in our homes and trying to make the best of what we're in. The first joy is from Amanda Maine. I found out Thursday that I'm accepted to a Master of Arts teaching program at Augusta University for elementary education. I've been out of school for 13 years so I'm excited and nervous, but also happy, because I still have a few things to take care of before I can start this fall. It probably won't feel official until I start my first day of classes. And it is all online programs, so thankfully, the pandemic won't interfere too much. Kate Williams is now home from the hospital. And the last one is from Lynn Dennison, her mother just celebrated her 100th birthday with a small outdoor gathering of immediate family. This was their first time together in over three months. It was followed up with a Zoom party of over 50 friends. And our last stone is for all the joys and sorrows unspoken in this congregation. And why don't we be include the whole world today. Whatever we can do, great or small, the efforts of all of us are needed to do the good work of this congregation. The offering will now be received online, and if you wish to give to the church, the link will be on the screen.
Please join me in a moment of meditation, which will be followed by silence. The written portion is A Father's Day Prayer by Kirk Lobman Coughlin. Let us praise those fathers who have striven to balance the demands of work, marriage, and children with an honest awareness of both joy and sacrifice. Let us praise those fathers who, lacking a good model for a father, have worked to become a good father. Let us praise those fathers who, by their own account, were not always there for their children, but who continue to offer those children, now grown, their love and support. Let us pray for those fathers who have been wounded by the neglect and hostility of their children. Let us praise those fathers who, despite divorce, have remained in their children's lives. Let us praise those fathers whose children are adopted and whose love and support has offered healing. Let us praise those fathers who, as stepfathers, freely choose the obligation of fatherhood and earn their stepchildren's love and respect. Let us praise those fathers who have lost a child to death and continue to hold the child in their heart. And let us praise those men who have no children, but cherish the next generation as if they were their own. Let us praise those men who have fathered us in their role as mentors and guides. Let us praise those men who are about to become fathers. May they openly delight in their children. And let us praise those fathers who have died but live on in our memory and whose love continues to nurture us. Amen and blessed be. My dad died 22 years ago on the first day of June, so it's hard for me to forget Father's Day. I still have some of his things. I have his name. I'm a junior, Donald J. Cameron, and I'm Donald J. Cameron, Jr. I have the Cameron coat of arms, which was important to him. I have a photo of his parents. Both died before I was born, and I never knew them. I still have his academic hood from podiatry school, and I have a surgical gown, and I have his World War II yearbook from the USS Arkansas, and included that is a letter he wrote to his parents asking them to get him out of this blankety-blank military right now. I still have the Lincoln bookends and the Carl Sandburg six-volume autobiography of Abraham Lincoln. I still have that. And I've kept the great-great-grandfather's ring because when I was, I think, in junior high school, the house we lived, a lot of pine trees. And so we're always raking. And the ring came off my dad's finger. And he got very upset. It was very important to him. And I'm not bragging, but I was, I was the one who found the ring in the bag of pine straw. My dad and I are the same size. So I wear a few of his clothes. I still use the trimmers from his podiatry practice to cut my nails. 
There are other things of his that I have as well. I have his feet. Now, that's not a podiatry joke. I swear, my feet look just like his. I have his eyes, dark brown. And I have his gait. Some of you probably notice, sort of bent forward. Because we both have herniated disc in our back and curvature of the spine. And so when I walk by store windows, I see, I see myself as my dad. I see my dad, because I walk just like him. I have some other things of his, too. A love of animals, especially dogs and cats. A love of music. We always had, Dad always had this big stereo and music filled the house. A love of sports. He would play with me for hours. I think he thought I might be good, or at least he hoped, but it didn't turn out that way. But it was fun. And then what I remember most is the Little League tryouts. And they would put me in left field. I can't hit a baseball, I'm not really good at that. But they put me in left field because I could throw it all the way to play. But to my chagrin, here this fly ball came straight to left field, and I dropped it. And I didn't throw it back to the field. I picked the ball up and I threw it into the ground, right in front of my father, who was watching the tryouts. I also have had from him a love of the outdoors. He always wanted me to think for myself, and he really avoided telling me what to do on purpose. I learned from him the importance of hard work. He also taught me, whatever the odds, be self-confident. And he told me many, many, many times that he loved me. Of all the physical things of his I still have, it is the things he left inside me that are the most precious gifts to me. I leave you with a reading a member gave to me when I served the UU Fellowship in Laguna Beach, California. The author is unknown, but it does have a title, The Bagpiper. Time is like a river. You cannot touch the water twice because the flow that has passed will never pass again. Enjoy every moment of life. As a bagpiper, I have many gigs. Recently, I was asked by a funeral director to play at a graveside service for a homeless man. He had no family or friends, so the service was to be at the Pauper Cemetery in the Nova Scotia backcountry. As I was not familiar with the backwoods, I got lost. And being a typical man, I didn't stop for directions. I finally arrived an hour late and saw the funeral guy had evidently gone, and the hearse was nowhere in sight. There were only the diggers and crew left, and they were eating lunch. I felt badly and apologized to the men for being late. I went to the side of the grave and looked down, and the vault lid was already in place. I didn't know what else to do, so I started to play. The workers put down their lunches and began to gather around. I played out my heart and soul for this man with no family and friends. I played like I've never played before for this homeless man. And as I played Amazing Grace, the workers began to weep. They wept. I wept, and we all wept together. When I finished, I packed up my bagpipes and started for my car. Though my head was hung low, my heart was full. As I opened the door to my car, I heard one of the workers say, I've never seen anything like that before, and I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. Apparently, I'm lost. It's a man thing. Happy mother, uh, happy, whoops, happy Father's Day, everyone. <laughs>
senses and hear the earth call. Feel the deep power of being in all. Keep with the web of creation your vow. Giving, receiving as love shows us how. Wake now my reason, reach out to the new. Join with each pilgrim who quests for the true. Honor the beauty and wisdom of time. Suffer the limit and praise the sublime. Wake now, compassion, give heed to the cry. Voices of suffering, ring, fill the wild sky. Take as your neighbor, both stranger and friend. Praying and striving, their hardship. Our closing words are from Lauren Bellamy. If here you have found freedom, take it with you into the world. If you have found comfort, go and share it with others. If you have dreamed dreams, help one another that they may come true. And if you've done love, give some back to a bruised and hurting world.